First John. Chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Um, right at the end of this, um, like I said, um, David and uh, Rosanna are going to be uh, baptized this morning. Uh, <clears throat> they come from Salt Lake City, come from a Mormon background and decided that that wasn't the gospel. And uh, we appreciate them being here and traveling uh, all the way out here. And uh, they've done been to La Pachanga. Okay, so then they got to go to, uh, they got to go to Emo's. And then they got to go to White Castle. Oh, come on. China Buffet's pretty good. Okay. Just don't go to the barbecue place. I wasn't too impressed, all right? Just letting you know. All right, so that's like four restaurants you guys got to get on, all right? <clears throat> so anyway, uh, at the end of the service, we're going we're gonna to baptize them, all right? So you pray for them. First John chapter 2, are you there? Say amen. Uh, this is a message I preached uh, a few years ago. And um, so this week, every, every day of vacation, I'd, I'd sit down to eat there in the camper. I'd pull up my, my, little desk, my little laptop and I'd look at some of the verses that pertain to this. And I thought about, I said, well, you know, I'm going to be on vacation all week. I'll just pull out that old PowerPoint and I'll preach it again. And I don't think God wanted me to do that. So I just studied the issue from scratch all over again and I'm glad I did because I found some things and um, I'm not going to be able to preach all of this this morning and um, and I don't think I'm done putting the message together but it's a good message for us it's a good lesson for us okay so I want you to pay attention to the Holy Ghost and what the Holy Ghost is telling you this morning and Again, I am not preaching down to you in this message. No way that my conscience would let me do that. Because I struggle with the things of this world just like everybody else does. You would be surprised at what some of your fellow church members what it is they really would like to do. You'd be surprised. Okay? So, all of us who are affected by the things that are in this world, say amen. Okay. So, number one, I'm not going to be preaching down to anybody. I'm not going to be high and lifted up and make you all think that I've got it settled and I've got it all conquered. Therefore, I'm going to nail every one of you and you're going to feel about this big when you walk out of here, and you ought to. Okay? Number two, I, I ain't kidding you. God showed me things from the Bible, and I'm just, God's going to preach this a lot better than I can. All right? So we're just going to get into the scripture this morning. Let's read God's word. First John chapter 2, you there say amen. Verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know what that means? You're not saved. It means you're not a Christian. It means you're not born again. It means you're going to die and go to hell. That's what it means. For all that is in the world, and here's these three things. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember, that's like what I said a while ago. Here's Job, and the devil's punishing him. And here's Job's three friends telling him, curse God and die. And in your life, your three, fr your three amigos are lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And see, what happens is the devil will punish us Jump on us and say, see, this is what you get for serving God. 
Isn't this, boy, isn't this peachy? Isn't this nice? See how God's abandoned you? Why, you might as well just go back to drinking. In fact, when you were drinking, you didn't have these problems. You know why? The devil said, I got them. I'm going to give them a good life. I'm going to give them their best life now. But then you decided you was going to serve God. And the devil said, I bet I can talk them out of it. And your three friends were trying to convince you to curse God and die and go back to the old stuff. Go back to the drugs. Go back to the booze. Go back to the nightlife. Go back to just forsake it all and go back and party until you die. That's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. All these things are in the world. Uh, these are in the world, uh, and they are not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Some of you that have um, done drugs... And this could apply to anybody. Some of you that have boozed it up. Some of you that chase women or chase men. Which is worse? Wanting to get high and you can't get high. Or getting high and then coming down off of it. Which is worse? Getting drunk and getting a hangover to me, seems like is worse than wanting to get drunk and you can't, can't get to it quick enough. Does that make sense to everybody? Because look at this verse again. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. Because when you get high, it doesn't last long enough, does it? Let me tell you something. There is no high on this earth that's going to last for the rest of your life. There's no drunk in this world. There's no bottle of hooch in this world that's going to keep you drunk enough to satisfy you the rest of your life. There's no woman, guys, that you can conquer that will keep you satisfied for the rest of your life. Or man, you ladies. Uh, who was it saying this? I got it. Mick Jagger. Can't get no satisfaction. You know what? He wasn't kidding. Because he's one of these guys that did everything and could never achieve what he was looking for. Because lust passes away. And it's worse afterward than it was before it ever started. You remember, who was it? Amnon? David's son? Lusting after his own sister? Watching her? Looking at her from afar? Probably peeking on her while she's getting dressed? had this perverted lust in him, and he concocted a way where he could get her in bed with him. And he did the deal. And as soon as it was over with, he hated her! That's, that's the kind of stuff the world provides for you, isn't it? You get drunk, puke it up, find your head in a toilet bowl, Boy, you're really living it up, ain't you? So that's the lust passing away. The fun's over with. Okay? But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I've never in my life found more satisfaction than I have in serving God. That's not just religious talk. 
That's not just in the handbook of ministers, things that we're supposed to say. I'm telling you the truth. God is my witness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't know how to preach this. I need your help. It's your word. It's your Holy Spirit. It's your gospel. And these are your people. So, Father, you are the one who can deal with them in ways, God, that I can't. I don't know what everybody's done. I don't know, Lord, what everybody's capable of. I don't know, Lord, what, is, what really is on the inside of each and every one here, each and every one that's listening to me. But, God, you do. And, God, I'm asking, Father, that you cause me to say things that when I say them, the Holy Ghost is going to go to somebody listening. It's going to shake them and say, that was for you. When are you going to wake up? God, use me in that way. God, deal with me. Deal with my sins. Get me. Don't let me. God, don't give me a pass just because I'm the messenger. Because God, you know I'm just as guilty as everybody else is. And I need the same Savior, same blood, and the same Holy Spirit, the same Bible as these people need. I need the message, God, just as bad as anybody else does. So God, just help us today. Deal with us as only you can. Get down, Lord, into the very secret and private places of our own heart. And open up things, God, to our sight. Shine light, Father, in places, God, that we don't want light shined. Expose, God, who we really are. Even the things, Lord, that we've been trying to cover up. God, expose us to ourselves and to you who we really are. And do you work in our lives and then God calls us to repent. God, have mercy on us. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just awaken us to your word today. And Father, Lord, teach us, Father, what the Bible says. Help us, dear God, to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow you. And help us to remember every day that we live, Lord, that our three friends are going to constantly work against us in our lives to try to get us to curse you and then die. And God, I've come too far. You've brought me too far down the road Given me too many things, God, for me to just drop and lose everything now and turn around and go back. I don't want to go back. So God, deal with your people today, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, you know me. I went to the Bible to find out what the Bible said about this world. Psalm 73, 11 the Bible says, and they say, how doth God know, and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Now, let me tell you this. Let me tell you what the Bible saying here. Number one, the world can make you rich. The world can make you rich. But look at verse 11. Look at what he's saying here. How doth God know and is there knowledge in the Most High? The question is, does God really know what I do, what I think about doing, and what I want to do? Does God really know that? And the answer is, every one of you nodding your head yes. Of course He does. Of course God knows what's in you. Of course God knows the secret things in your heart. God knows the lust that you have. God knows the resentment that you're harboring. God knows the bitterness that's there. God knows the hatred and the envy and the pride that is in you. God knows all of these things. The world has something to offer you and the world will make you rich. But let me tell you something. God knows who you really are. So being worldly and looking good while you're doing it, that doesn't mean that God can't figure out now because God knows you. God knows who you are. Psalm 98, 8. Let the floods clap their hands and let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for He cometh to judge the earth 
With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Now you listen to me. Here's what we do. We look at other people, we look at their sins, and we say, well, bless God, I ain't as bad as they are. Right? Bless God, what I've done is nowhere near as bad as what they've done. So I must be doing pretty good. Now, I've done told you about that. We know what the Bible says. Don't measure yourself among yourselves. You're not wise in doing that. Okay? And what he says here, God is going to judge the earth. God's going to judge the entire world, and he's going to do it with righteousness. And he's not going to judge you based upon what somebody else did. How many of you ever had a teacher that did that? They, they graded everybody on a curve. Whatever the, best, whatever the best one did, and whatever the worst one did, Everybody gets judged based upon that. I think that's stupid. It teaches people that even though I got it wrong, I still get a good grade out of it. And I think that's stupid. I think if the question was true or false, and the answer is wrong, then you're wrong. And it ought to be marked against you. So what if Johnny over here... Got 20 of them wrong. Does that mean that the three that you got wrong should be counted right? No. So you see how it works? God's going to take you out of this world one of these days and He's going to stand you up in front of His holy court. God is not going to line everybody up around you and measure you up against them. He is going to measure you up against His righteousness and what He said. And if you did it wrong, then you're going to be found guilty. Can I hear you say amen? That's how God's going to judge the world. Isaiah 13, 11, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. O.J. Simpson got away with murder. Sure he did. He admitted it. He wrote a book called, If I Did It. And the, the guy that helped him write that book, they interviewed him. And they said, as OJ is reeling this stuff out to me, he said, doodads went up down my back. I just went, <gasps> he said, he said, I'm writing all these notes down, but in my mind I'm going, he killed her. Sure he did. And the earthly court found him innocent. God didn't. And O.J. Simpson is going to get out of prison here pretty quick. Next month, I think. And he's going to get to live all the kind of life that he wants to live. And one of these days, he's going to stand before Almighty God and be judged. And I promise you, he's not going to get away with anything. Am I right? Neither are you. If you do it, and it's wrong, God is going to punish you. Even if it looks like to you and everybody else that you did it and got away with it, does not the Bible says, be sure your sin, what? So here's the thing. We love the world. And we need to be reminded often that if we disobey God and go after the lusts that are in this world, God will punish us for that. Mark it down. How many of y'all really believe that? You should. And God's going to get everybody in this church that you think is doing something wrong, God's going to get them. And if they're innocent, God's going to get you. Amen? I mean, it's just how it works. Amen? 
And he said, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. One of these days, rest assured, God's going to put a stop to it. Amen? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to speak on this. I do not know if that cop is guilty or innocent. I do not know. I was not the judge. I was not the jury. I was not the prosecutor. I'm not his attorney. And I'm not in his mind. But I promise you, God knows. And if he's guilty, God's going to get him. He's not going to get away with it. And if he's guilty, I hope he doesn't get away with it. Murder is murder. I don't care if a cop does it. I don't care if a white cop does it. Black cop does it. I don't care who does it. Murder is murder. Let's, let's quit being white and black. Can we not just be saved, born again, loving righteousness, no matter who does it, and hating evil, no matter who does it? Just remember, there's always stirrers out there who are not happy until they've stirred up strife between us. And you guys know here a while back what that does to me. I hate every bit of it. And I won't have it in this church. We're not going to fight each other. And the fight's out there. But remember what Jesus said. A kingdom divided against... A house divided against itself will not be able to do what? And God wants this church to stand. And if we're too busy fighting and hating one another over stuff that we have no control of whatsoever, we can't stand. See how it works? Now, I'm going to tell you this. The devil, he goes after my family, and he goes after your family, and he goes after you folks online, you listen to this. You don't know what all goes on in here. Okay? The devil comes in here and gets people mad at one another and they want to spit and holler and, and get after one another. And then, you know what he's done this week? He's done it to the online group. He's gone after them. Stupid devil. Amen? I'm going to, I'm going to stomp on him one of these days. Romans 16. I am. I'm going to stomp him. I used to say that in front of my children when they were little. I'm going to stump a mud hole in the devil. And Lindsay heard me say that one time and she said, Yeah, Dad, stump a mud hole at him. I can just imagine what was in her mind at the time. Yeah. Splash! Ha! Ha! I got you. Okay. Isaiah 24, turn there. Isaiah 24. I love this church. I love you people. I want you to love me, and I want us to hate what we should hate. Hate the enemy. Hate the devil. Okay? Because he's trying to divide us. And he'll use every tool in his box in order to do it. Isaiah 24, <clears throat> verse 4. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world, look at here, the world languisheth... languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. Who in here knows the definition of the word languish? Anybody know? You know what it means? It means fade away. Look at your Bible. The world languisheth and fadeth away. You know what the word languish means? Fades away. It's right there in your Bible. The Bible gave you the definition of a word that you didn't know. Okay? The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Who, who is it that defiled this earth? Man did. How did he do it? His sin. God cursed the entire earth over what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. This earth passes away and all the nice things that we try to have languish and fade away, and it's our fault. It's because of our own sin, because we love the world. 
Because they have transgressed the laws. Watch this now. Here's, here's what being part of the world does. You transgress God's laws. And you will also transgress man's laws. Changed the ordinance. Broken the everlasting covenant. Do you know what loving the world will do to your theology? Loving the world causes you to change the Bible. That's what he said. They have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance. Oh, the original Hebrew does not say sodomy. It does not say sodomites. It says temple prostitutes. That's what it really says. So therefore, if I'm a sodomite, it's okay. And let me tell you something. Your love of the things of this world will cause you to change God's Word. Your theology will be different. Amen? Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. I want you to take this now and apply it to your life. You got into this thing, you got a little backslid on God, you turned away a little bit from the Bible, you don't pray, you don't read your Bible, you kind of get worldly, you, some of that old lust starts coming back in. That old pride kicks in. You know, what, you know what's going to happen? All that that is going to do is cause desolation in your life. Because you love your sin and you love this world, you know what it will do to your marriage? It will cause you to stop loving your wife the way you're supposed to love her. Am I right? Can I use the word pornography? Pornography causes men to not love their wife as much as the women they're looking at. Ladies, it's the same way causes you to change the Bible. It causes you to change what God said. It will cause you to break God's everlasting covenant. That's just, that's just one issue in this loving the world thing. Um, it will cause desolation in your marriage. It will cause desolation in your family. It will bring desolation in this church. And I don't want it here. We are so blessed because just about every Sunday somebody comes in this church from God knows where. Salt Lake City, Tennessee, Florida, Georgia, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. God's bringing them in from everywhere. They're not coming here because we're worldly. They're coming here. They're not coming here because we have a rock and roll band. They're not coming here because we have a nice coffee shop out front and a bookstore selling t-shirts. They're not coming here because we're worldly. They're coming here because they see that there's a bunch of people sitting here that want to live the way God wants them to live. And they have the same kind of junk going on in their life as you people do here. Am I right? Verse 7. The new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth. There's two phrases right here. The new wine is the Spirit, and it's the Bible. The new wine mourneth, and the vine languisheth. The vine, Jesus said, I am the vine. Now you watch this. As your love for the world increases... Your love for the Word of God and Jesus Christ diminishes because you cannot love both. As your love for the world increases, your love for church service decreases. As your love for the world increases, your love for prayer decreases. Folks, this is simple stuff. 
The new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry hearted do sigh, the mirth of tabret ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the harp ceaseth. They shall not drink wine with a song, strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. The city of confusion is broken down, every house is shut up, that no man may come in. The first, the first time you drank, I promise you, was a whole lot better than the last time you drank. Now, am I right on that? Huh? Okay. But you get what I'm saying, John. Work with me here. I'll shoot you dead. The first time you drank. <sighs> oh, boy. Woo! And the last time you drank. Am I right? That Bible's right. Strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. They shall not drink wine with a song. See, the first time you went to parties, you singing and dancing on the table and drinking and having a good time. In 20 years of that, you ain't dancing on the tables no more. You're laying under it. Matthew, Turn to Matthew 13. How much of this am I going to deal with today? Let's deal with Matthew 13, then I'm going to cut it off. Matthew 13. Turn there in your Bibles. Don't, don't read the screen. I'm going to do a trick on you. There, how's that? Matthew 13. <laughs> Matthew 13 is loaded with stuff that you ought to pay attention to. My understanding and doctrine of salvation it is based a lot on the parable of the seed and the sower. It is. I, I just I keep going back to that. That's it right there. That's how it is. That shows you who goes to heaven and who does not go to heaven. I don't care how many years they've been in church. I don't care how many, how much tithes they paid in. I don't care how many amens they said during the preaching. There are preachers and church members all over this country that are going to burn in hell for all of eternity. Why? Love of the world. Matthew thirteen twenty two. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Now let's make this application. There are things in the Bible that God says to the husbands and God is saying that because he wants the husbands to have a fruitful relationship with their wife and with their families. Amen? God wants the wives to admire the husband. God wants the children to obey the father. Right? If that guy, if that man is a decent man and he wants to live for God and he, he's just, he is sick of this world and doesn't want anything to do with it in his personal life, then I promise you, you will be a fruitful husband. Your wife will look at you and say to herself, I love this man. He has blessed me. I thank God for his friendship. He's like, I couldn't ask for a better husband. That kind of stuff, right? A man that's a godly man, his children, in their minds, they'll say, uh, Dad said we better do this. I think we ought to do this. Dad said so. 
and somebody wants to make fun of their dad, they'll say, that's my dad. Don't you make fun of my dad. That's my dad. You got it, guys? That's what fruit bearing as a man looks like. And I promise you, the love of this world will cause you to be the worst, stupidest, most worthless husband and dad that this world has ever produced. Guys, am I right? Ladies, am I right? Children? Who is it, guys, that sees you when the other people in the church don't see you? Your kids do. Guys, who is it that sees you when even mama doesn't see you? Okay? Do you remember dad flipping the motorcycle backwards, Melissa? Hey! Suzuki motorcycle. Wham, 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 boom! He's like, don't tell mom. <laughs> we knew dad had some faults. But our dad never did us wrong. Did he, Trish? Never did us wrong. He worked, he supported his family, he gardened to feed his family, he hunted and fished to feed his family and to teach his son how to do these things. Didn't take very well. But I literally, I don't hold anything against my dad. He was a fruitful dad because I saw him grow and change. And he realized that the world that he desired when he was 19 was not the world that he ended up with when he was 50 because it tried to kill him. And I don't hold anything against my dad. My dad wasn't like some of the other dads that people have known. The deadbeat dad. The fornicating dad. The adulterer dad. The drunken dad that hit mom around, beat the kids up. That kind of dad. We don't have room for that kind of dad in this church. If you're that kind of dad, get it under the blood. Or I'll be your biggest enemy. Mark it down. It'll choke it out. The love of this world will choke out everything that can be good about you guys, gals, and children. Church members. In the workplace. The American workplace is a joke now. And it didn't used to be that way. You know why? Too many people got too much love of this world. And now nobody has any respect for the American worker anymore, do they? This Bible's right. Let me, let me go to this. Okay? I'm going to go to the end. <clears throat> There's a man by the name of Demas, D-E-M-A-S, okay? I'm going to show you what the Bible says about Demas and what can happen. Paul said in Colossians 4.14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. When Paul was writing this letter to the Colossian church, Luke, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, and a man by the name of Demas, who was there serving with Paul, was mentioned in Paul's letter as a fellow laborer and a brother. And he said, Luke, you know Luke, right? The guy, the, the gospel writer? And Demas, who's working here with me, they salute you. They want you to know that they love you. And they're praying for you. And they, they care about you. And then in Philemon, chapter 1, verse 23, there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Marcus, who I think was Mark. Aristarchus. Demas... Lucas, who I think is Luke, the beloved physician, my fellow laborers. He mentions Demas and Luke again as fellow laborers in the work of the Lord. Church members, Paul's right-hand men. I'm going to say something. 
I have become aware that God has sent me some good guys. Some of you have been around a long time. Some of you are fresh and new. And I thank the world of you guys. And God's going to use you guys in this church. You want, to, you want to be used? You want God to do some good things with you in this church? I do. Okay? And I've been praying specifically for the men in this church. This is what God's burdened my heart with since Brother Mike hutzel has been here. That's part of it. Okay? And I think God's going to do some good things for you guys. Your love of the world is going to destroy that. And that will kill me. That will absolutely kill me. I'd hate to lose any of you guys. But your love of the world is going to do it. Because 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul said, Demoth has forsaken me, having loved this present world. The guy that Paul, twice now in the Bible, he was, had counted on Demas. Called him a fellow laborer. His right hand man. Demas got to looking at some women he shouldn't be looking at. Wasn't coming home at night, but first he stopped off at the pub on the way home. He started shooting pool with guys. Started doing things that husbands and dads ought not be doing. And he loved this world and it caused him to forsake. You know, who, you know who the Apostle Paul represents in this verse? Here he is right here. Paul wrote 14 books out of the New Testament of your Bible. He represents the Gospel. He represents the Bible himself. And I'm telling you, guys, your love of the world will cause you to walk away from the best friend you have ever had. And it'll do it every time. Don't be Demas. Amen? Don't be Demas, guys. This church needs good men. I need good men. Because I can't do it by myself. And it's not right for the women in this church to be standing in a role that the men should be fulfilling. So we need good men. And your love of the world will destroy this place. I don't want that on my conscience. Amen? I don't want it on mine. Let's stand to our feet.